and here we are. Good morning on a amazing special day. You know, in our family, every day is Thanksgiving, but uh, certainly for Americans, Canadians got a head start a few weeks ago, I believe. I don't know, do British people have Thanksgiving, Belgians? No, no, like it's not something that we do. Um, I don't really know why, like I think it's quite a nice thing to have, um, especially mm. um, where you are thoughtful of um, all of the things in your life and you give thanks and gratitude um, to, to all those things and the uh, people in your life. So I think it's something that's really nice to do. Um, so I don't know why we also don't do it like it's... <laughs> yeah, well, it's Thanksgiving. And if you're not, uh, it might have to do with the fact that it's a more complicated story than just a day devoted to saying thank you and expressing gratitude. Um, that's kind of like the cleaned up version, but we're not going to get into the politics. We don't need an excuse to have a day to say thank you. So today's that day for a lot of people, um, as crazy as a year it's been. And, uh, and there are certainly many people that have been sick and there are people that have lost loved ones and in no way ignoring that or whitewashing or making light of that. But for those of us that have been able to stay well enough, it's been a challenging year for everyone in some way. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful for the family that I have, that I don't go through this time alone, that I have an amazing wife and great kids. Um, and I'm also grateful for people like you who have become new friends. And, you know, we've been able to connect in real time, if not sharing the same space, at least sharing this kind of time. And it really speaks to the power of technology to rise to the occasion, which is so perfect. So my name is Ari Schneider. These are conversations, and uh, I do want to let you know, you'll be the first ones to know if you're listening now, we kicked off a uh, contest. I figured Thanksgiving was a good time to give back. So if you're interested in winning a pair of AirPods, here's the catch. You go to our blog page, and all you need to do is listen and share your favorite highlight, your favorite quote from all these 30 plus conversations we've had we're gonna to put together an end of year mashup edition. And we're gonna co-create that with you, people who are listening. So in return, if you'll contribute to that collection, uh, the website's really easy. You go to the blog page or schneiderspeech.com slash blog slash contest, boom. And then by the end of the year, my hope is that we will take those, put them together and create a wonderful episode that'll be the best of the best. And I have no doubt there'll be some gems today. So check it out, win a pair of AirPods. We're gonna run this for about a week, a week and a half, give people a chance this long weekend to put some stuff in and see where we go. But now, without further ado, we have the privilege today. Uh, most Americans would not do this. So it took a Brit living in Belgium, my good friend, Gareth Walcom. Um, he is originally from the UK. I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce the place he's from. He now lives in, is it Ghent? Yes, Ghent. Great. Um, now, in addition to being an all around awesome guy, he's a person who knows stuttering from the inside, being a person who stutters. And he is leading the way in terms of looking at how we can use virtual reality technology and the science around that to bring meaningful impact into you know, therapy and next level opportunities for people to move the ball forward. Um, he's going to help us understand what most of us think is very trendy and techy and beyond us. His expertise is really in, in virtual reality and related fields and bringing that into the healthcare space, um, much broader than just stuttering, but he really has probably the best handle on what's possible in terms of integrating virtual reality into the way that we work with stuttering. And it's a great honor and privilege to have Gareth joining us for the conversation. Thank you. Tell us what you, what I left out that you think is important and that you might want to share as important pieces of your journey, whether it's uh, what's current that I missed or maybe taking us back to 
you know, little Gareth getting us to where we are today. You, you've been, you know, relocated from England. Now you're in Belgium. You're, you're really globally networked and connected. Um, so fill us in on what you'd like people to know. Sure. Um, so um, I'm from a town called uh, Pazingstoke. Um, and, um, and I studied in college there. Um, but because I wasn't really that much of a fantastic student at school, um, I had to do extra years at college um, just so that I could get into university. Um, which was like a big mistake at the time, but when you're young, you don't really realize stuff like that um, until you get into college and you think, ah, like I do need the grades. I want a good job. Um, so I better start to study. <laughs> um, so then um, I went to, yeah, like I studied in college and I got the highest grade possible in my course. Um, which was a bit of a flip from the bad grades in school. Um, and with those, I decided to study at uh, Nottingham Trent, um, which, um, is the, which is a university in the uh, Midlands in the UK. Um, and there I studied a uh, bachelor's degree in uh, digital media tech, um, Tontology. Um, so this course was basically creating uh, games for teaching, learning, and uh, training purposes. Um, and it was also heavily involved in virtual reality as well. Um, and basically in the course, we had to do a project and there were a lot of projects that were there to choose from, um, but I wanted to do something my own. Um, so I decided to combine my knowledge um, with something very um, personal to me. And I created a virtual reality and exposure therapy for people who stutter. Um, so, this was basically like a pilot study in a way, but it was a bachelor's uh, dissertation. And at that time, I had no idea how big this could get. Um, I then decided to take the research to a, a master's. Um, so I studied a master's in medical products design. Um, where I improved this further. Um, so I included um, a, 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 my tracking within my virtual reality uh, project to improve it and to take it further. Um, yeah, so that's basically that part of my life. Um, and it's really kicked off um, and it got a lot of media attention. It's been featured in the uh, PBC. Um, it was even on the news, I think a couple of times. Um, yeah, so like it's done really, really well for itself. Um, so I'm really pleased that I decided to choose something personal for, for uh, me. Amazing. I'm just sharing this with a couple of our friends and groups. And if you're watching, give a like, drop a comment. We'll try to incorporate your comments and questions. And you can help us by giving it a like or a comment or sharing it with people that might appreciate listening in. Um, Gareth, you know, like <clears throat> a lot of kids like video games. Not everyone takes it as far as you have. Um, what can you share with us lay people to understand it's not just video games. It's not just Halo and running around, you know, shooting people up or, you know, army ranger type style games. What, what's the value of, of the world that you're in? Because so few people are there, um, you're really leading. And I think a lot of people overlook the value and sophistication. So if you could bring any light about it. 
yeah so um um uh, virtual reality um instead of having something on a screen this is now still on the screen but it uses a pen, pen, pencils um in front of the screen so it essentially increases your field of view um so it so it makes you feel as if you're in the scene itself um and it also makes the scene 3d so it's a 2d screen it now becomes 3D and it feels as though you are actually there um and there's been a lot of uh, research shown to feel uh, um um to, to to show that people actually feel as though they are actually in the scene um, and they feel like it's a real as well. Um, and this has got many links to um, social anxiety, to uh, phobias, to uh, PTSD and so on. Um, so as people can relate to these scenes, they can uh, uh, evoke the anxiety um, and then they can start to work on this anxiety to uh, decrease it. Um, so it basically uh, better prepares them for the real thing. Wow. So if we're thinking about Zoom and we're thinking about virtual reality, I've been saying, you know, I wonder what life was like during the Spanish flu. You know, every 100 years or so, the planet goes through some sort of pandemic or epidemic if you study a bit of the history. It's amazing to live in these times where technology of Zoom 10 years ago, just it was, it was Skype, for those of you that remember Skype. It was a bit more sticky. Um, Zoom has really made what we're doing right now uh, relatively seamless in a way that was unimaginable just a few years ago. How, how far do you think we're going to be 10 years from now? What's a picture of what's possible in terms of we're dealing with a flat screen interaction. It's one dimensional. You can't smell the fact that I haven't showered in days. You know, um, we're missing some of the sensory experience, but, you know, and, and many of us are missing touching loved ones and sharing a hug and, you know, the smell or the taste of food. How, how, how do you see us moving ahead? Because you're really in that space. What do you think is going to be possible 5, 10, 20 years out? So the uh, cost of these virtual reality headsets will uh, t t t t t decrease a lot. Um, that will be the first thing, but also at the same time, the technology in these are I mean, improving. Um, so we already have um, uh, MI tracking within the headsets. Uh, we also have a EEG um, on some of the headsets. Um, there are plans um, for some headsets next year to be able to track the facial movements. Um, so that would be a huge step forward, especially for and especially for uh, speech. Um, then other types of technology. Let's 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 come back to that in a moment, because you, in all our conversations, you've shared the significance of tracking eye movements. So I'm interested in coming back to that and, and why that's such a pivotal piece. But yeah, bring us into, I grew up on the Jetsons. If you, if you grew up on the Jetsons, drop a I comment. I mean, right, there are certain things like the video phone that were, that were foreshadowed and, and were kind of like part of those futuristic, impossible, along with the flying cars. And I forgot what the helper at home, I forgot what her name was, but she could like cook up yeah. anything instantly. And it was kind of like a vending machine. So a lot of those ideas have come to play. What are some other things? Where could we see just like a consumer experience <clears throat> using VR and AR and all that? So I think uh, holograms, um, maybe not in 10 years, but a bit after that. Um, also, uh, contacts. So, contact lens. Um, lo um, a lot of the uh, larger companies already have uh, pat patents 
for this. So you can overlay your view with the um, with the contact and hence itself. Um, so I'm sure that will be um, in the space a lot. Um, yeah, like I think along those kind of lines, and of course, uh, uh, AI um, in the future will be a big um, influence as well. Uh, but I think mainly the holograms and contact lenses will be big. Amazing. So I guess Google Lens and the spectacles from Snapchat was a good first go. But yes. You see more iterations, more iterations of that, not just to capture what you see, but also to kind of give you that interactive experience. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. You know, I always am amazed. <coughs> the human body is so incredible. Um, you know, talking about putting a lens of a chip on a contact lens, it's like, wow, what innovation. And it is. But when you stop and you think about the eyeballs and like the optic nerve, and visual processing. Uh, I didn't prepare you for this, but is there anything in those laboratories and you know, cutting edge development in virtual reality that compares with the complexity and sophistication of the eyeball and the visual system? Um, it's still on the uh, lower space. Um, so um, basically the uh, virtual reality headsets that are out there at the moment are something called uh, load dynamic range and um, by this I mean that um, it can't uh, represent a very high level of uh, luminance in relation to the real uh, uh, situation itself. Um, so the headsets itself have a very long way to go um, but yeah like it's improving more and more um, and with the quality of these headsets, we are starting to see um, something called um, pixels per inch and pixels per degree um, improve more and more. Um, so the quality of the of the scene um, is is much uh, click, click, clearer to what we see in, in real, real, real life. The little bridge that I wanted to make there, which is amazing. It's amazing to see, you know, in the past 10 years, the acceleration of, of technology and development, but it's amazing also the eye and the visual system is incredibly complex, perhaps only rivaled by my favorite other system, which is the speech motor system. And so for those people watching who stutter or care about stuttering, I often share that the complexity, the innervation of the vocal folds, for example, there's no part of your body that has as much innervation per unit space as the vocal folds. And the things are the size of your pinky nail and they move hundreds of times a second in many different dynamic positions in rapid succession. And so the complexity, the subtlety, in a way we could say the fragility <coughs> of the system, it's almost more surprising that people don't stutter, then it is surprising that some people do because the speed and the succession and the, the way it's uh, sensitive to changes in the brain. So whether those are hormonal shifts or biochemical shifts or you know excitement in the brain, nervousness experienced in the brain, when the brain changes, there are certain places in your body that it plays out more than others. One of them is in your vocal folds. And so I just want to put that out there for some people that might be worth thinking about. Instead of thinking of stuttering as the deviant thing, it's more remarkable that some people don't stutter because it's truly uh, incomprehensible to you know, pull that off. And you've been talking about eye tracking, so you can take this where you want, but I was interested either your reflections on stuttering and you know, VR and insights into speech motor and then brain and then what you were talking about, the eye tracking and why that matters. I'll also just give a plug while you think for that moment. I kind of put a lot out there. You can go anywhere you want with it. If you want to see when we put this up for the replay on our blog page, but even on the event page, uh, 
on our website describing this wonderful conversation. Gareth's been on a world tour. He recently spoke and it was shared the Australian Speakeasy Association. He gave an incredibly insightful presentation there, which is available on YouTube and I shared it on our site. And he's been presenting uh, quite actively over the past few months. So it's a big treat to see him. But if anything you wanna see deeper or see more organized, feel free to check it out either on our website or search on, on YouTube and we'll share his information as well. But Gareth, yeah, take that where you want to, because I'm still thinking about the eye tracking, so. Yeah, so um, in relation to the uh, eyes, um, so um, people who stutter can sometimes close, flicker, or fix it in the moment of, um, in the moment of a uh, stutter. So just like myself, um, and this is only measured um, in a sub, objective way by a speech and language therapist, which is uh, totally f f fine, um, but it's very difficult to measure this, um, especially as a speech and language therapist has to measure many different things at the same time, we have to look at the speech and so on. Um, so um, what I did for my masters was um, I used a eye tracking virtual reality <laughs> headsets um, to, uh, to uh, tr tr track these moments. So I created some software uh, that could track the exact moment that somebody closes their eyes, how long their eyes are closed for, and where they are looking within the scene. Um, and with this, the speech therapist can have a look at this information and they can see, um, okay, so at this moment, the uh, client closed their eyes for this amount of time. Um, then they can see how much this was associated to their speech. Um, then over multiple sessions in VR, they can see if these improve through certain types of therapy. Um, so it basically is a nice tool for speech therapists and also for uh, researchers to, to choose. Fascinating. So uh, it's a little eye-opening, no pun intended, that you can you can find great value in terms of what's going on in the eyes and, and metrics from the eyes to shed light on stuttering. Usually people are looking for what they can hear. Uh, or what they can observe in that way. Can you share a little bit? Is that is that demonstrated equally across all people who stutter or some demonstrate uh, more of a presentation in eye movements and reactivity in the eyes? Um, so it's very uh, varied um, uh, and so is stuttering itself. Um, so um, some people who stutter, they can close their eyes much more often than others. Um, some people have their eyes closed uh, for the entire time that they are speaking. Um, but yeah, like um, with speech therapy, you are basically taught um, to look into the eyes of your um, listener. Um, it uh, doesn't have to be for the full amount of time because sometimes that can be a bit strange. Um, but yeah, like try to look less at the wall and, and more at the person that you are you are speaking with. Um, and I have a, a video to uh, share. Um, should I share that now? Listen, there is an entire audience of people from around the world. They do not want to hear me. They want to see and hear Gareth. So there's no time like the present. What a treat. You're going to get a demo uh, Gareth is going to show us. And Anita's here and Danielle Rossi's here and so many of our friends. So keep dropping comments and questions because Gareth is so next level. I'm so out of my league. So I could use your help if you have questions or places you want to go. But buckle your buckle your seatbelts and uh, what was her name, Doris? I think Danielle Rossi got, the, she was the helper. Was she the helper? Danielle. Uh, uh, Doris? Jetson. Rosie. Rosie. Ah, from the Jetsons, Rosie. Right. There okay. we go. The Jetsons. Yeah. So I think you've got permission <laughs> to uh, share your screen. Go cool. ahead. 
so uh, I'm about to show something uh, that is a, a video from my masters. Um, so this showcases my eyes. Um, and this is the person that I am speaking to in VR. Um, and it might be very hard to see here, but all of this here are changing in accordance to what I do with my eyes. So whether if I look at the roof or the back wall, the floor or the heads um, and uh, so on of the person that I'm speaking to, all of these will change, um, including the amount of time that my eyes are closed for. Um, so with this, the speech therapist or the researcher has the information that they need to uh, work on. Um, and then they can and then they can advise in whichever method of therapy they uh, choose. Yeah, keep that up. That is that is incredible uh, just to see this. Thanks for sharing this video. Um, so can you share a little bit more of what you, now just to be clear, you're not a speech therapist, but you're involved in the application of VR in clinical situations for speech therapy. And I think you'll share with us where you've gone with that. Um, but obviously you're a person who stutters. So you certainly are qualified, in my opinion, to be the expert on this conversation about stuttering. What do you see as the application or the way this could be useful in, in a real life clinical application? Yeah, so um, this can be used as a tool um, where the speech therapist can uh, fully immerse their clients um, in, um, in a, a scene of their choice. So whether if it be a, um, an interview, uh, public speaking, uh, a scene like this where you're just only talking to well, one person. And within this, they can basically practice the techniques that they've learned in speech of te therapy. And in this time, the speech therapist can track exactly uh, what the person is up to. Um, they can also offer them certain advice as they are in there. Um, and this is something that is incredibly difficult to do in real life. Um, so in the real um, situation itself, it's very difficult to control uh, the situations. Um, and it's very difficult to build up to the situation that you want to do. For example, if you want to speak to 40 people, um, you, 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 usually wouldn't, you usually wouldn't go straight into this speech with 40 people. You would want to slowly increase it from one to five and so on. But even this is hard to do in real life. Um, but with virtual reality, you can uh, you can uh, make these custom scenes into something that suits your needs, um, and you can uh, better prepare for these situations in real life. I'll just give a immediate example. <clears throat> right before we got on the call, I recently was working with uh, a young guy named Darren, not his true name, but Darren was making a list of situations where his stuttering bothers him. His stuttering kind of makes it tough for him to communicate freely. So we made a list of those situations. And then as he's, as he's expanding his comfort zone, as he's speaking more freely and talking about how much more comfortable he feels communicating in different situations, he said, yeah, but I'm on the lacrosse team. And when it's time for the coin toss, oh, that's, that's rough. So that's the next thing on his list. And, and what Gareth was saying now, the holy grail of speech therapy in some ways is how do you bring the encounter of whatever's that therapeutic experience into the person's real life? And uh, certainly, you know, I can share some ideas of what we do, certainly less, uh, some technology, but nothing at this level. This is next level. So I think, is that fair to say that this is really a, something that can help bridge that incredible distance from what happens in a person's real life and then that controlled laboratory environment where most therapeutic experiences happen, this is a way to make a bridge. Is that right? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and it's also, <laughs> a, it's also a safe uh, bridge. Um, a, mm. because the speech therapist is next to you, and B, because the scene can be totally controlled 
by the speech therapist who should know to what extent you, you can experience the situation, uh, but also it can be stopped at any time, uh, which of course is very difficult to do in real life. So I'll give you the example. You tell me where we could put some goggles on this kiddo, but uh, he wanted to do the coin toss. So we, I did a screen share like your screen sharing, but my screen share was on Google. I found a virtual coin toss and I had his mom sit down with him and I created different levels of pressure where I kind of pretended to be the umpire or the referee. And I said, okay, it's, it's showtime, it's playoffs, here we go. You better call it before it falls. And I tried to create some artificial time pressure and social angst about it. Uh, and then we did the coin toss and what do you know, <clears throat> he had a pretty easy time, but that doesn't tell me that he experienced something that was similar to what he'd experienced in real life. So it was therapeutic, but I certainly felt limited. Where would this come in? How could this be applied if we take that like very real life scenario? So instead of the situation that's, oh, I'll just uh, stop this video here now. Um, so okay. instead of the um, situation that you were in, which is a, a, a one on one situation, I guess on uh, Zoom or something, um, um, he, he would be placed in a totally uh, virtual scene. So he would be in the chosen environment to represent that scene. So there would probably be people around him, I guess. Uh, there would be uh, noises in the scene. Um, and with this, you have a more uh, realistic uh, response and you can uh, better uh, relate it um, into the real thing. Um, yeah, so um, you can basically control these situations. You can change the amount of people in there. You can change the uh, faces of the people that are in the scene, make them maybe look a bit meaner um and just try to test the person um um, 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 um in this but gareth can tell you the first time that we spoke we scheduled i don't know an hour and about two and a half hours later we were still crushing it, it th this is so important and often overlooked and i'd love gareth to share what he's doing with some of this but to lead into that i just want to share as a clinician working with so many people who stutter, it's interesting to me that so many people don't realize that the situation, the context, it's not just about me and a sound or a word. Uh, a lot of the triggers and levers that can make it uh, exacerbated, experience more stuttering more often or more intense or have less stuttering and have it be less intense uh, is very much influenced by situational context. And so it's not uncommon that going over to a person of one gender at a social gathering might trigger it differently than walking to a person of the other gender, depending on the dynamics that might be there of attraction or pressure or judgment, also how attractive they are, uh, how tall they are relative to you. Um, you know, your position. I remember when I was in grad school, I had a professor, his name was Dr. Phil Schneider, the greatest, the GOAT. Um, and it was a lot of pressure to do the homework. So he gave the classic assignment to all the grad students, go out and do some pseudo stuttering, practice what it's like to fake uh, what it might be like to experience a stutter. <clears throat> and you've got a group of really exceptional students. Um, I managed to squeeze in because I had some connections, uh, but the best of the best at Queens College, big shout out to QC, my alma mater. And I, here I am, the son of the professor, and I am avoiding this exercise until it was the last day. It was like two hours before lecture. And I find a place where it was like a anteway, like a corridor where there was like a door into the building and then another door. So it was like a passing situation. I wasn't going to get stuck there. I could escape lots of doors. And I noticed who did I choose to do this with? Someone very short, someone of the opposite gender, someone that appeared to be a foreigner. And I made all kinds of judgments to choose this person because I knew I felt a certain amount of comfort, a certain amount of control. And the, the lesson for me was that 
what if I didn't have that choice? What if I wanted to speak freely with anyone in any situation? And all of us have different levels of discomfort in different situations, but for a person who stutters, this can be so instrumentally important and make such a difference. So I think what you're talking about, the ability to manipulate the, the atmosphere, the environment in which the person is having this experience is a major contribution to what could be done clinically. So maybe you could share a little bit about how you're bringing that, bringing that forward and what kind of things people can take advantage of. Yeah, um, so, so I'm now actually starting to uh, make this um, into something that people can use. So all of the knowledge, all of the experience, uh, the skills that I've learned over many years of a university of speaking with other people who stutter, with speech therapists uh, and uh, researchers. Um, I'm now making this um, into something that people can use um, and basically as a toolkit. So it's open to them um, and to however they want to, uh, to, to choose it um, because um, not only do I think it's really important that this is used, but it's also something that I really, really like to do. <laughs> um, I, I uh, loved my masters um, and it's um, like from a, a personal side of things, um, it was something that I really liked to, to, to uh, make. Um, so now I'm actually uh, moving into this full time uh, very, very soon. Um, and I'll be, uh, I'll be um, pushing for full speed ahead on this. Um, so that real people can start to use it, whether if it be a speech therapist, a, a researcher, or um, a person who stutters, or even uh, someone with a speech uh, disorder uh, and they just want to practice speaking in a safe place um, this software will allow them to uh, to do that I love that and I think the other the other added value here as as uh, Gareth keeps sharing is the safety of it I think very often both in certain circles of self-help and also in certain therapeutic experiences people are encouraged, sometimes even pushed beyond their comfort zone. Um, and that can be stressful. And sometimes we grow through stress. Like when you're lifting weights, you can't build muscle if you're just doing you know, one kilogram at a time. So you've got to create some stress in order to have growth. At the same time, too much in the wrong timing, in the wrong way can have a scarring effect. It can be hurtful. So the beauty of this is the ability of the person to pull the plug on it. Um, I'm so excited that you're talking about going ahead full speed, but I think it would be more appropriate to go at ludicrous speed or light yeah, speed, exactly. given given the nature of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, yeah, so um, this will basically allow uh, the person in control to adjust the scenes into um, into something that's a customizable, um, where they can they can create a certain scene with um, with uh, how, how many other people they want to practice speaking. Uh, there will be sounds in there and so on. Um, so it will be really realistic. Um, and yeah, like I'm, I'm really pleased that I've actually made this choice because it's something that I've been hoping to do for a very long time. Um, and yeah, like just speaking to uh, to uh, to other speech therapists and to people who stutter and so on, um, it's still really, really needed. Um, so yeah, like I'm really, I'm excited about the future. Um, but of course, um, I. I have learned all of these things from from my past, from the uh, from the stuff I've studied at university, even from my speech of therapy uh, that I had. Um, so when I was about uh, seventeen or eighteen, um, I I um, did a uh, 
um, an intensive speech therapy course at City Lit, um, which is a very renowned uh, um, uh, uh, centre. Um, and Just this a quick, really quick shout out to City Lit, and it's hard to keep track where Gareth was at. So City Lit is located in London. If you have the privilege to be in the UK, check it out. Yeah, like it's a great place uh, with really nice speech therapists. Um, and this speech, this speech therapy really changed me. And not only my speech, but it changed the way that I uh, think about my uh, stutter. Um, because in the past, it was something that I feared. It was something that I thought was bad. Um, but actually, I've kind of turned the, these uh, negative thoughts uh, uh, upside down into something that's probably become my own uh, uh, greatest uh, strength. Um, so that course really, really helped me um, along the line. Um, and yeah, like other courses that I've done, even your uh, course online, um, it's... <laughs> Hold that thought. I, I just want to lean into something else you said and then circle back, because I do want to get this free consulting from you in terms of how we can incorporate VR to just take what we're doing to the next level. But you said you transformed it into your greatest asset or greatest strength. I forgot the way you said it, but I always find that fascinating as a person who has such admiration for people like you, uh, people who, <clears throat> for those of us that don't have to measure our words or wonder if our mouth is gonna cooperate with us this time around or doubt because we're pretty sure it's not. Um, so when I see people who who live with stuttering, and I think a good analogy my father likes to use is like, I've got this allergic cough right now. Thankfully, I'm healthy, but every few minutes I have an involuntary interruption in my respiratory system. I didn't ask for it, not my fault, and I could either cancel all my meetings for the next three months or do the best I can and lean into it and, and use mute so I don't blow your ears off. But <clears throat> being considerate of others and considerate of myself, I can carry on person who stutters, it's not three months, it's often a longer relationship with stuttering. And so I have the utmost admiration. And I think that people like yourself are truly heroes. Could you share something about how this albatross kind of transformed from something that gave you these nagging negative thoughts, perhaps even gnats. Um, and then, you know, you're talking about turning it into a superpower from kryptonite to superpower for people that don't get that or what does that mean to you? Yeah, so with a uh, stutter, I mean, it's very uh, normal for uh, people to have many uh, negative thoughts, uh, lots of fears, lots of anxiety. Um, there's lots of things that you choose not to do um, because of your speech. Um, so in the past, I would avoid certain situations um, and those negative thoughts would build up and up. So then you would really, really avoid them. Um, also avoiding certain words. Um, but yeah, like with the speech th 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 therapy, it really assessed um, what's kind of under the uh, level. So there's the typical um, stuttering um, an iceberg analogy where the stuff on the top um, of the iceberg is the stuff that you see, which is the stuttering, all of the eye uh, closures and so on. But underneath, there's actually a lot that you don't see. Um, and as you kind of address these issues, it doesn't only improve your speech, but it improve, um, but it improves your quality of life. Um, and from then on, I decided that, yeah, like, um, I, I, I can speak in, in all sorts of situations and I should just, um, I should just tackle them, uh, um, if I want to. 
And just so everyone knows, like, that's probably the most powerful few moments right there. The rest of the conversation is kind of cool, but that right there was pretty epic from my point of view. Um, I think you could listen to that again. I could listen to that again. If you're listening, that might be one to put in the raffle. So if you're joining now, we do have this contest going. We're looking to co-create with everybody an end of year highlight reel. So we've launched it today. You can go to the blog page, schneiderspeech.com slash our blog. And you'll see if you just scroll down a little bit or right at the top, there should be a post about a contest. And it's very simple. Listen to one of these conversations or more. We've got 30 plus conversations up and available. You can watch all of them for replay on our blog page. Um, and we're gonna make a highlight reel of the quotes, the inspiring insights, the best of the best. We'll put that together for the end of 2020 because everybody needs something nice at the end of this year. Uh, and if you do that, we will enter you into a free raffle to win a pair of AirPods. So I'm just giving it away right here. That was, that was epic right there. Um, you mentioned, <clears throat> and I was excited when you reached out to share with me about the really awesome things you're doing. I also, you know, asked you to take a look at some of the things we're doing with this Transcending Stuttering Academy and trying to think about, it's, it's really tackling the same problem from different angles, which I think all good people are trying to do. If, if you have local uh, resources available, if you're in London and you can access City Lit or you can access the Palin Center, or you're in a place where you can access the best professionals in the area that know what they're doing with stuttering, fantastic. But many people find themselves geographically distant or financially you know, challenged to access really good care for stuttering. What you're doing is I think really gonna be some really epic stuff to break down those boundaries. And I shared with you our online course and then the cohorts that we created these eight week weekly groups for teens and adults using the course, but the magic really happens through the community. Can you share anything about what you saw there and how you could see we could infuse, or enhance, do better with some of your insights and some of your, your development? Yeah, um, so um, especially with the um, of virus at the moment, um, it's very difficult to give speech therapy in person. So of, of course, it's now switched to uh, video chats, which, um, it does have its good parts but also it's like it isn't quite the same and there's a certain number of things that you, you can't do um and your, your course what um, i found was pretty good um because it addresses many different aspects of stuttering and it really makes you think tape down what is happening it in these moments um yeah and um like i think that's the way that a lot of stuttering therapy will move towards um because of course you can access more people um uh, not only in the same region but all over the world um and as it's on their laptop as you have a pdf uh, which you can print off and do all sorts of stuff for for um, I think it's a great move forward. So like, I definitely think that there'll be more things like this in the future. Amazing. And you can see Gareth's uh, in-depth review, but uh, it was really great to hear Gareth, you know, see value in that. And the goal is not reaching people, but giving, putting things within people's reach, you know, and helping people experience real growth and breakthroughs in whatever way they're looking for. So that's what we do. And that's why these conversations are so informative for all of us, everyone who's listening and for us as well. Um, someone asked, I don't know him, but I wonder if from his name, you might recognize the name, Gert Runyas. Um, maybe. <laughs> well, Gert, thanks for joining us. Um, are there already, I think, movies uh, or maybe he means scenes in VR, or he or she, uh, to use with an audience of 40, 100, 200 people, like you were saying, where you could kind of give someone that experience and, and dial it up. Does that exist? Or the video you showed us was really just, you know, one person? Yeah, so um, uh, um, um, I think his name is uh, uh, Chet, um, because 
and it's a uh, Pelgin name, so you just touch on the uh, um so there isn't really that much thank you that exists. thank you for yeah, that it's, it's okay <laughs> i may be the speech therapist but i am i am experienced with having my name mispronounced and i am notorious the notorious mispronouncer of names i got together socially with someone from sweden and uh he had an hp printer and he was asking me can you help me fix i have an hp ink yet so I found out that the Swedish, also the J turns into a Y. Obviously, people that speak uh, Spanish, the double L and lots of other things. So in Belgian, the G turns into a, a Y as well. Um, into an, uh, into an, uh, 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 um, H. Um, H. So it's like, for example, a uh, guy would become he. <laughs> so thank God, thank God, English is our first language, and we're used yeah. to all these no, <laughs> no rules rules. Yes. Um, so the stuff that exists at the moment, there isn't really anything out there that you can control. Um, in kind of a speaking situation. Um, there are some uh, stuff, um, uh, some uh, maps that you can use, which are for social anxiety, which uh, are uh, public speaking and so on, uh, but they don't really address speech. It's more of kind of uh, practicing in an anxiety provoking situation um, and they don't really allow you to control the size of the audience um, so there's basically two different types of virtual reality um, one is where you create the 3d models like uh, what i showed in the video and one's where you um, um, and the other is where you show a, a pre-recorded video so you see a video of a real scene that's being pre-recorded and these are where most of the uh, virtual scenes are at the moment. Um, but with these scenes, they're very hard to change um, because you would need another pre-recorded scene in the change that you have made. Um, so in that sense, you would need all of these uh, videos in uh, 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 one place. Um, but with uh, creating stuff as a 3D model, you can adjust this in a field time. Incredible. Wow. So we, we heard from Hurt. Is that how we say it? Yes. Yes. Hurt. 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 So, yeah, he <laughs> said his name, his name was Hell in his younger days, but now he's an SLP and a person who stutters. That's ah, awesome. okay. Um, yes, and uh, Anita says she wouldn't want to be called that in Swedish. I won't even, I won't even go there. But Anita, the same person you're thinking of is the person who made the comment. And of course, Danielle Rossi, who says his name is mispronounced anywhere outside of Italy. It's a shame he lives in Canada. <clears throat> ah. But uh, I will say, my name, I think, takes the cake when I've got my first Blackberry. Anyone remember those? Um, yeah. It was before Zoom. So they had a little button in the middle and you'd click it to send, but it would ask you, do you want to change any of the spelling? And if you just kind of kept clicking it, eventually it would send your email. So it's sending a very important email. Uh, I think it was like a job application or something like I'm your man. And the Blackberry is like, you know, it's not sending. So I just figured what most people do with a computer, just click some more. That usually works. So I click away only to realize after it's sent, I had triggered it to fix all the misspelled words, but it got to my first name, Yuri, or I pronounce Uri. And here I was sending my application for an important position. Uh, I'm your man, yours truly, Urin. <laughs> and that was before you could pull things back. So thankfully, Gmail has that feature. I could recommend it to everybody. They could pull things back. And thankfully, VR is bringing us forward and uh, Gareth is leading the charge. So I just wanna share your 
contact if anyone wants to reach you gareth where can they do that um, sure um so um it's my first name and then my last name at gmail.com uh, fantastic so first name last name at gmail.com uh, i would love to invite everyone to consider highlights from this very conversation you can head over to our blog page enter the contest boom you could win a pair of airpods and it's thanksgiving weekend i got a little surprise what i want to do is some of the people i mentioned have already gotten access but i'd like to give free access to the online course for anyone that would like to see it for this whole Thanksgiving weekend through Sunday. <clears throat> all you have to do is go to our website, drop us an email on the contact us page, and we'll send you a code that will give you access to uh, take advantage of the course. And I just want to thank Gareth. Um, this has definitely been one of the most visually stimulating and eye opening conversations that I have had the privilege to have. And since our first conversation and more so today, I am having trouble stopping thinking about creative ways to integrate these kinds of things, these virtual reality uh, applications into really impactful ways to help people who need to make that bridge from a very sterile controlled environment into real life change. And I just wanna encourage everybody to to learn more about what Gareth is doing, get in touch with him if you're interested, whether it's in the research side or the application side, look at his videos, which will be posted on the replay on our blog. Um, but you could also look up the Australian Speech Easy. I think that's one. I don't know if there are others that Gareth would share. Um, so the Canadian Stuttering Association, I think is only available to um people who signed up to the event uh, but i can always um share my uh, slides um and stuff um and i also presented at a vr conference um uh on saturday actually and this was totally in vr um so i can also share those slides as well um if you would like to see those slides amazing so I feel like someone just took my shirt off. My virtual <laughs> background just disappeared. So this is the little cubicle I'm in. Oh, okay. Those walls are actually uh, just ah, wallpaper. Okay. Behind, behind them is egg crate, you know, material to absorb sound, as is the ceiling. But um, gratitude is the attitude. Authenticity is the way to go. Gareth, thanks so much for this. Wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, whatever your situation is, when you can find something to focus on and have gratitude, it doesn't take away the challenges of life, but it does make things a whole lot more meaningful and a whole lot more bearable and even give you a chance to thrive, even in the midst of very challenging situations. So I hope everybody takes advantage, whether you're an American, a Canadian, uh, Belgian, having your chocolates or, uh, you know, having tea time in England, be American for a moment and enjoy Thanksgiving. If you can't get your hands on a drumstick of a turkey, just give thanks and feel American for a moment. Wish everybody an awesome day, a great weekend, and big, big thanks to Gareth and all the people that have joined us. Please give a like, share, and next week we've got another great conversation. Check it out on our website, schneiderspeech.com events. Take care, everybody. All the best.